Welcome to Movie Libertas, one of the best and only libertarian movie podcasts on the YouTubes. How are you all doing? I hope you are all having a fantastic day. There will be spoilers in this review. However, the first five minutes of this video, of my reviews, will not contain any spoilers. They will be very ambiguous, and it'll just be me giving some general thoughts. And then after the five minute mark is up is when I go into a deeper dive and talk about specific scenes and how they relate to each other to give you my exhaustive thoughts and feelings about the movie. Here's what I can say about Joker while remaining ambiguous. The film was interesting. It was realistic. It was grounded. It had a really gloomy type of atmosphere. But even though it was gloomy, you didn't leave the movie theater feeling dispirited. You didn't feel miserable towards the end of the movie. You felt like you watched a good movie. And when I went in, and then when I went out, my... During the movie, my expectations were almost 100% subverted. Somewhere between the 85 to 99.9% .9 mark of my... That range of my expectations were subverted. I went in because I watched the movie trailer. And the movie trailer shows scenes of chaos happening around. And the Joker kind of blending in with the background. So I really anticipated I had this expectation of this Joker being a Heath Ledger type of Joker and there there very much was an inspiration from the Heath Ledger style Joker I did read an article where they said that no this Joker doesn't have it hasn't taken influence from any of the other live action interpretations of the Joker and I don't believe that because I feel like without the Dark Knight Heath Ledger's interpretation of the Joker this realistic interpretation of the Joker, where the Joker's skin isn't stained white from chemicals, and he's not disfigured into smiling because of the because of chemicals or whatever sort of reaction it had on him, they went with the realistic route of there being paint. So I'm really dubious of that claim. This movie, the Joker, it wasn't Heath Ledger. Joker. It wasn't even Jack Nicholson Joker. Although, you can say that this Joker had elements of the Jack Nicholson campiness, and also had the realistic tone of Heath Ledger. But this movie was not what I expected. It's not a big crime uh, heist movie. So, don't be fooled. It's a psychological um sort of descend into insanity kind of when you're Arthur which is you know the, the the alter ego of the Joker in this movie um this is very much a spin off of the Joker and Batman sort of dynamic it's not part of the DCEU this is its own universe and if they did expand on this universe i would almost prefer this universe to the DCEU I think this universe is, I think Warner Brothers has finally captured something that they haven't captured since the Dark Knight trilogy. They kind of captured it with Shazam and Aquaman, I think they're finally, you know, uh, landing on their feet. Batman vs Superman wasn't that bad in my opinion, I thought that was an alright film. But Shazam and Aquaman were de are definitely the highlights of the DCEU. But Joker is so different. It, it It's really rejuvenating to have it as a movie in the DC, under the DC name, with the rest. It's distinctive comparatively to the rest of Marvel and DC movies. Alright, so I'm going to start getting into spoilers now. Consider yourself warned. Alright, this is, we're at the five minute mark. Okay, consider yourself warned. We're getting to spoiler territory. So, Joker. <laughs> As I stated earlier in my more ambiguous thoughts and feelings about the movie, it is a rejuvenating addition 
to comic book movies. To the comic book movie franchise in general. Take everything that you have expected from... Or take everything that you got used to from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Or any Marvel movies before that. So that includes uh, Blade... Sorry, uh, Wesley Snipes' Blade. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. The Amazing Spider-Man. The Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, forget everything you know about... Uh, what we've seen from the DCEU. Forget everything you know about Christopher Reeve's Superman. Even even forget the Dark Knight trilogy. I would say the Dark Knight trilogy is the only thing that I could probably bring up that the Joker is closest to. Not in style. Not in a stylistic sense. But with the gritty and gloomy aspect of it. You know, the, the dark and grim, naturalistic, authentic, and grounded element that the Dark Knight trilogy had, this movie, Joker, has. Um, and let me, right off the bat, let me just say that this movie is not that violent. You see much more violence in the Avengers series. In the first Captain America movie, the first Avenger, there's more violence in that movie than there is in this movie. However, I do think there was a controversy around... Well, I actually don't know why there was a controversy around this movie. The Punisher on Netflix was far more bloody and violent than this movie. Now, I can confidently say that the violence... In this movie is impactful. It's not gratuitous. It's not even... The violence in this movie isn't venerating violence. It's not glorifying it. Violence is an aspect of this movie that is necessary for this story to be told. And I'll get into that in a little bit. This movie uh, inquires into themes about class, mental illness, and... Particularly about the mental illness part, it dives, it inquires about society's collective thoughts, apprehensions, and overall attitude about mental illness. Um, that be, that's a pretty big plot point, and kind of becomes the modus operandi, or the principle of the Joker's modus operandi, that that makes him motivated towards the end of the film. This film, it blurs... So this is the violence aspect, in a way. It blurs the lines between an equal, responsive, and necessary reaction and overreactions. Proportionate reactions. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit as well. Um, but one aspect, another way to frame it, is that it touches upon the difference it, between self-defense and vengeance. And kind of blurs the lines between both. Self-defense, you know, I think most people can agree that self-defense is okay. But there is sort of a gray area where self-defense no longer becomes self-defense and you become the aggressor. The movie also touches on uh, class perspectives. The Dark Knight trilogy, and I would say one real aspect of... Uh, Batman and the stories around Batman. It typically in Gotham itself, the 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 city is a character within itself. Has always had some allegory that talked about social classes and classism and what different class dynamics. And I'll get into that in a little bit too because this film does it in a different way than I, I think. There's two. In the movies, in in the movies that have Batman, including the animated series or any other animated films, even Gotham the TV show, there's two epitomes of what I feel that really touch on a class classism allegory. It touches on class quite well. That's the that's Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight trilogy, 
specifically with Batman Begins and uh, The Dark Knight Rises. And then this movie, Joker. Uh, the Joker in this movie feels authentic. He feels grounded. He feels gritty and grim. And the film, however, despite being you know, dark and gritty, it doesn't make you feel miserable or dispirited. And this, I'll talk about that in a little bit too. There is an arc with this character, uh, Arthur, or Joker, as he becomes. And, well, I mean, obviously, it's an origin story and a good movie, for the most part, has a character arc. This movie manages to be profound, thought-provoking, and stylistic without being pretentious and convoluted. And to me, this shows that you can tackle complex and divisive ideas without being esoteric or ostentatious. And that's how I really feel about the movie. There are certain movies um, that shall remain nameless right now. I'll touch upon those in later podcast episodes. Some movies get a little pretentious. Their characters start speaking in uh, Lephantic. I think Lephantic's the right word. They don't speak in colloquial terms. They, they, what's the word I'm looking for? Lexophanic. They speak in lexophanic tones in a lot of more pretentious movies. Which means, you know, you're being wordy, you're, you're speaking a word salad instead of just using colloquial terms or using a parlance that is appropriate for the average moviegoer. This movie manages to be profound and talk about complex ideas without being pretentious and having to use wordy, philosophical, uh, word salad uh, dialogue. It's not lexophanic, which is, you know, the, the right word to describe that sort of thing. More pretentious, or even ostentatious language. Um, so that's why, th those are general thoughts about the movie. So let me dive into it a little bit, because, boy, oh boy, is this movie interesting. So, when I say it blurs, blurs the lines between, uh, you know, in, uh, an appropriate proportional response to an overreaction or an overproportional response where it kind of blends the lines between self-defense self and vigence. Um, this movie, so I guess I'll t I'm going to compare this movie a lot to The Dark Knight because The Dark Knight is the closest existing, I think, uh, comic book movie to The Joker, or The Joker more accurately falls into the Dark Knight camp. Man of Steel tried to fall into the Dark Knight trilogy camp, but it just didn't. It failed. It won't work. It's not realistic enough. You know, you can't have an alien crash to Earth. and Because I feel like in this movie, Superman would never exist. In this movie, Batman would exist. Just like in the Dark Knight trilogy, Batman exists, but Wonder Woman would never exist. Superman would never exist. So that's why... I'm comparing these two, but they both have something to say about uh, vengeance and justice and self-defense. So in The Dark Knight, it had a justice versus vengeance type of feel. In the beginning of Batman Begins, Bruce Wayne wanted to seek revenge. He wanted vengeance. Uh, he wanted to kill the person that killed his parents. But the thing is, is his parents were killed when he was a kid, and at the time he's seeking revenge, he's an adult. So it asked the question... Alright, is is killing criminals okay? Ultimately, they decide that... Mm, I mean... It's not... You can blur a line between killing criminals who kill people. But you have to be careful because you can become just like them. Because there's instances with James Gordon, who, you know, eventually becomes Commissioner Gordon. You know, he, he uses guns violence and there was a huge battle at the end of the dark knight rises so the movie's not outright saying that you know killing a bad guy 
is necessarily immoral, but there is a context. In this case, this person served the person that killed Batman's parents, Bruce Wayne's parents, in the Dark Knight trilogy. He served his time. You can say maybe it was a slap on the wrist. Okay. And he had a court case. He went through the legal system, got punished for it, did the time, and then he came out and Bruce Wayne was going to commit an act of vengeance, an act of revenge. But is that okay? Would it have been okay if Bruce Wayne killed him out right after he killed his parents? Maybe. But it touches on that topic. Um, and, you know, talks about justice versus vengeance and how sometimes vigilantism, it can cross the line. But Joker, this movie, well, there's a few scenes. The first instance is the subway scene. So, Joker in this movie, Arthur Fleck, is his name, his legal name in this movie at this point. He has a mental illness, and one of his tics is an uncontrollable urge to laugh. And he kind of chokes when he's trying to keep himself from laughing, especially when he's laughing during an inappropriate time. And this is a real thing. This is something that is seen in schizophrenic patients. It's a tick that they have. And Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, Arthur Fleck, carries around a card. So if he is laughing at an inappropriate time, he gives the card to somebody who feels uncomfortable. So they know that says, I have a medical condition. Um, this laugh is one of my tics. It, you know, people who suffer head trauma suffer from this. So, and that's an interesting uh, setup that does pay off later. But the, there's a scene where he's on the subway. He has an uncontrollable... Well, here's the scene. He's on the subway. He's in his clown getup. Because he just got done... He just got off work. You know, he's a, he's a professional uh, performer or clown. There's a girl sitting on the subway. She's just reading a book. And these three drunk... Uh, unrespectful uh, hooligans or, uh, or rapscallions are bothering her and they're not sexually assaulting her but it implies that they would have if she didn't leave. Yeah, they're being assholes, right? They're kind of catcalling her, I guess. Not the, hey, you're looking good, but the, you know, they're being obnoxious. They're, they're being what no guy, no matter what your political belief would want their daughter to be treated in public. They're, they're doing that. She looks over at Joaquin Phoenix. She gives him this look like, are you gonna, do you see this? Are you gonna help me? Or are you like one of these guys? But he starts laughing one, from one of his tics. And the guys go over and they start fucking with him and they start beating him up. He pulls out a gun, which is a storyline within itself. He pulls out a gun though, and he shoots two of them in self defense. Fair enough. The third one runs away. And it's a pretty... It's not a lengthy chase scene. But at this point, the threat has been neutralized. Because the two two of the friends are dead. This guy got shot in the leg. And he's trying to run away. But the Joker comes up to him. Kind of intimidates him and kills him. Or Arthur. Because he's really not the Joker yet. And that's where it kind of crosses the line from self-defense to vengeance because the threat was neutralized he already killed two people he could have let the third one go who was already injured and was obviously outmatched because you know Joaquin Phoenix Arthur the Joker had a gun and then there's another instance where he is angry at his mom and he has a reason to be angry at his mom and maybe I'll talk about that in a little bit but he takes it way too far. So that's another example. And then he has this idol, uh, this talk show host, very much in the fashion of like Jimmy Kimmel, uh, Conan, um, uh, John Oliver. I think that's his name, John Oliver. Uh, John Stewart. Uh, Trevor Noah, you know, The Daily Show. And that type of, you know, TV show that, uh, sort of late night comedy show. This is a show that he bonds with his mother over. He watches this show. 
But his idol betrays him. And this is the failed comedian aspect. We've all seen the trailer or the preview where his this guy is mocking him. But this guy is his idol. So eventually, you know, he um, Arthur has a grudge against this specific individual that mocked him on live television. And he takes it out in a way that's not really healthy. There's also an instance where he was wronged by one of his co-workers. And he kills this co-worker in a brutal way. I mean, it's not gory or that brutal. Like, there's movies where there's more gore, more brutal. But it's an impactful moment because it's a turning point. And you feel the violence. So let's get into the class perspectives part of this movie. So, in the Dark Knight trilogy by Christopher Nolan... Bruce Wayne, and even his parents, you know, when he's a kid still, they're looked at as, uh, you know, wealthy, altruistic philanthropists. But Joker, that movie, shows a different perspective from the downtrodden, low class. To them, Thomas Wayne, he, he comes off as a, a rich, con contemptuous elitist because he, he kind of refers to, uh, Bruce Wayne's dad is going to run for mayor. Thomas Wayne is going to run for mayor to help poor people because Gotham is basically falling apart. It's becoming Detroit as we know it. For us, the equivalent would be Detroit. So, Thomas Wayne is running because he wants to clean up the streets. He wants to help the poor. At least that's what he's saying. But the poor see it as th just this out-of-touch, rich asshole who steals all the wealth from us. Or, you know, something like that. A, a left-wing, lower-class type of perspective. And it comes off, it de they depict it in a way, Thomas Wayne is on the news. The subway, the subway murders or the subway kills that Joaquin Phoenix Joker, Arthur Fleck, does inspires a left-wing anti-rich movement um, and they dress like clowns <laughs> and they're kind of rioting against the rich they say kill the rich and stuff like that and Thomas Wayne basically says that he refers to envious poor people as clowns who haven't done anything with their lives and the jo the Joker, because of his actions, he inadvertently causes a left-wing revolution, kill the rich, even though he himself, he's not going on a diatribe against the rich, but that's what it inspires. And it doesn't help that uh, Thomas Wayne called them clowns, said that, you know, poor people are clowns. So this movie doesn't see Thomas Wayne or the Wayne family as the altruistic, wealthy philanthropists. That every other interpretation of Batman does. And that makes sense because this is from the perspective of somebody who isn't wealthy. So it talks about that. The movie isn't necessarily about that. It's not saying... The movie does not say that rich people are bad. And it also doesn't say that poor people are bad. Because in the movie, there are poor people who genuinely care. Or who are genuinely good people. Who are just trying to make ends meet. And then there's also rich people who are minding their own business, are doing their own thing. So this movie isn't taking a left-wing position saying the rich are bad. It's also not taking the opposite position and saying that, you know, poor people are stupid, poor people are trashy, or anything like that. So this isn't one of those types of movies, but it does touch upon it and uses it as a story element. And you really get a different perspective. And this is sort of why the Joker is unique. This interpretation of the Joker is unique. Um, so let me talk about how the Joker... He doesn't start out as a malicious person. But he does end up embracing a vengeful and more violent nature. So he started out with the sole purpose of bringing joy and laughter to other people's lives. And this is a virtue imparted by his mother. Um, however, from his perspective, no one else cares about his happiness. 
as a result of the the characteristics and actions that he has and takes that he so okay um he so he doesn't start let me let me rephrase this or uh, restart he he started out you know, with the sole purpose of making people happy and bringing joy to their lives. And this was a virtue imparted by his mother. However, from his perspective, no one else cares about his happiness as a result of this. And uh, this sort of identity crisis that he goes through, which I'll get into in a little bit. He begins to embrace and augment characteristics and actions that he took throughout the film. Which had inadvertent effects of a rather unignorable scale. And then this becomes his sort of catharsis and antidote to his personal mental illness. And that's kind of how he becomes the Joker in the movie. So it all kind of builds up to this ending scene with his idol where he goes on a diatribe against his idol and then he says you don't know what it's like to be me and he's not coming at it from the perspective of I'm poor and you're rich he's coming at it from the perspective of I am mentally ill and you people don't notice me you don't understand me and you mock me but now people are seeing him and in this movie Joker is kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? He's, he doesn't belong in this world that he's in. You know, he, he's, he's an outlier, he's an outcast. He, what's the word I'm looking for? He really doesn't belong in the world. What? Anyway, he, he doesn't belong in the world that he's in. He's such an out tribe or an outlier. Sorry, I can't talk now because I'm trying to think of what I was trying to say. It's it's a pretty strange dynamic. It's not a strange dynamic. It's Basically, his motivating factor, no, motivating, I guess, driving force in a way. He doesn't, like, go out wanting to cause chaos. There's a line in The Dark Knight from Alfred where he goes, where he says that some men just want to watch the world burn. And in this movie, it's not necessarily that the Joker wants to watch the world burn. However, he he sort of embraces the fact that he's creating chaos because it's getting him noticed. And nobody else noticed him before. So he doesn't become the Joker for, you know, for some nefarious, evil uh, uh, sort of reason. And what I was trying to say was that Joker in this movie is incongruous, meaning he doesn't blend in with his any, within his background, within the group, or anything at all. And that's what makes him very interesting. The Joker has never really fit in, but they really amplify that aspect very well in this movie. So to get into more, even more spoiler territory in this specific movie, so I mentioned his anger at his mom. So there's this interesting dynamic when I saw this movie... I, when I was watching it, and as it was unfolding, I was like, no, are they really doing that? No way. So throughout the movie, Joker's mom is writing letters to Thomas Wayne. She states that she used to work for him, and she tells Arthur that if he knew what conditions we were living in, he would help us because he's a good man, which is the perspective that we get from Thomas Wayne and every other interpretation of him, specifically the Dark Knight trilogy. Um... 
And, you know, Arthur's like, well, why do you care? He's just a billionaire. You know, why would he care about us? Why should we care? Why are you obsessed with him? This is further evidence that Arthur, or this is the first sort of evidence that Arthur doesn't really care about class. That's not what, that's not his goal. His goal isn't wealth. His goal is happiness and finding a meaning in his life. And at one point he tells his therapist, you know, I feel like, or we think he tells his therapist. There's, there's a piece of dialogue from him where he says he felt like his whole life he never existed. Anyway, so back on to what I was talking about. Eventually, his mom gives him a letter at one point and says, can you put this in the mailbox? Out of his curiosity, Arthur Fleck opens the letter. This is Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, Arthur Fleck. Opens the letter, and in the letter, it very clearly states that um, Penny Fleck, Arthur's mom, had a relationship with Thomas Wayne back in the day when she worked with him and that Arthur is the illegitimate child or an offspring of Thomas Wayne and she's basically saying you know you need to help our son so this just infuriates uh, Arthur and he loses his shit he's yelling at his mom you know what the hell he eventually tells her, you know, she's like, I, I'm not going to talk to you when you're angry. So he calms down. I'm not angry. So his mom tells him the story about how they were in love when she worked with him, worked for him. Um, they had a kid and uh, she, he said, he told her that it wouldn't be good for appearances if they were seen together. And if he was, you know, raising her kid and whatnot. And she had the kid alone. And... This is setting up, and you're like, wow, Thomas Wayne is a real dick. So, Arthur eventually tracks down Thomas Wayne, sneaks in, sneaks up to him, and confronts him, you know, saying, hey, you're my dad, you know, Penny Fleck uh, is my mom, and eventually he learns from Thomas Wayne that, no, your mom's fucking crazy, uh, you are you were adopted, and this is just confusing, this is torment to Arthur. This is a huge turning point as well. It's obviously mentally unsettling for Arthur. It's mental trauma that he's just going through because he thought that Thomas Wayne was his dad. Bruce Wayne was his uh, half-brother. And then all of a sudden this guy is lying to him. Like, you're lying. Why are you telling me I'm adopted? I, Penny Fleck is my mom. Why are you telling me you're not my dad? She told me everything. So eventually he goes to Arkham Asylum because at one point his mom was incarcerated or uh, incarcerated or, you know, uh, checked into Arkham Asylum or enlisted. Uh, I don't know what the right word would be. Anyway. And he's looking up the files, and, you know, the guy at the desk behind this, you know, sort of cage, he's like, oh, um, well, you know, I, I, I can tell you this much, but I can't really tell you much about, you said Penny Fleck is your mom? Oh, okay. well, I can't really tell you, I can't release these files to the public unless you get your mom down here to come and sign papers. So Joaquin Phoenix, or Arthur, steals the documents, reads them, and he finds out he actually is adopted. This angers him even more, infuriates him even more. And at this point, Arthur is already the prime suspect in, in the investigation for the subway murders. And they question his mom, stressed out his mom a bunch. His mom's already kind of crazy, already stressed out. She's poor, she's stressed out. She thinks Thomas Wayne is her, is, uh, her baby daddy. So she's stressed out about that. Uh, she had a fight with her son. So she stressed out about that, and these detectives start questioning her about the potential of his son, of her son being a murderer. And eventually, she has a stroke. So in the hospital, his anger leads him to smother his mother with a pillow. He kills his mom, and I mean, in reality, it's not his real mom. Not that it makes it any better, but he kills his adopted mom. And you find out in those files, actually, um, a bit of a revelation, which explains. Some of Arthur's mental illness. Because his mom's mentally ill. But then we find out. Wait he's adopted. So why is he mentally ill? But then you realize. And it shows a flashback of an interview. Of her with a doctor or a psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum. And. And a newspaper clipping. 
she let her boyfriend abuse him, and she abused him too. When Child Protective Services found Arthur, he was chained to a radiator. And the card that he read, this is the setup and payoff I was talking about. The card that you read that said that his laugh or his tick was a condition he had, which is common with people who have head trauma as well. That payoff is that he had head trauma. He was bruised. He was malnourished. He was chained to a radiator. He was beat by his, uh, I think it was either his, not his adopted father, but his mom's boyfriend. And we assume that his mom beat him too or... You know, let it happen. Anyway. So, that explains not only his laugh, that explains his mental illness, his schizophrenia that he appears to have, which causes him to dance. So, I want to talk about what this Joker kind of reminds me of. Like, it, this Joker reminds me of a combination between Jack Nicholson's Joker and Heath Ledger's Joker. It had uh, the campiness and zest of Jack Napier. Um, the scene I'm specifically thinking of is when Jack Nicholson's Joker robs the art museum and he puts on that show, you know, all the dressed up crooks that look like dancers from Greece or something. And, you know, he's wearing the purple suit with the cane and he's dancing and they're, um, tagging all the art. They're vandalizing the art with paint and stuff. And he's doing that little campy dance. That is the zest I'm talking about that this character kind of has. But it's more... It's not because he's a campy person. It's because of his mental illness, which makes him kind of weird. So one of his tics is that he likes to dance. And he moves in a weird way when he is dancing. And he also enjoys dancing. But it has the realism of Heath Ledger's sort of you know mysterious Joker. This Joker isn't mysterious in the same way Heath Ledger's Joker is. This is just a realistic interpretation, um, which is why I said earlier when I read the article that said that Joker, Joaquin Phoenix's uh, version of the Joker, wasn't influenced by previous Jokers, I said bullshit because without the Dark Knight, I don't think that this Joker would have even been a consideration. Would they have been, let's do a realistic Joker where he's not chemically altered. He just puts on face paint. I think that was an inspiration from Christopher Nolan's interpretation of Gotham, Batman, Joker, and Bane. Because Christopher Nolan, you know, he, he wasn't a comic book nerd. And he wasn't really a superhero aficionado, even though he read some material. But he didn't know a whole lot about it. And if you watch Christopher Nolan's films, they border on a more grounded sort of level. Even in the movies where he does wacky stuff, like Inception, it's in a dream sequence. He, he does you know, play with certain aspects of surrealism in his realistic movies. But he tried to justify every aspect in his Dark Knight trilogy in a way that would seem real. Because he was trying to make this movie for a more general audience, as opposed to just superhero aficionados or comic book readers. Which is why the Dark Knight trilogy was so successful. Because it blended, it was a perfect comic book movie, it was a great Batman story, but it was a realistic, L.A. noir, gritty, soup not superhero, but crime movie a type of action flick. So that's why it did so well. But, so just to sum up what I just said, uh, he has Jack Napier, Chris, uh, uh, Nick, Jack Nicholson's campiness, the dancing, with uh, Ledger's dyed hair and face makeup. But this Joker is a unique interpretation. He has, a, instead of the orange and green suit that we're used to with the Joker, he instead fashions a red, green, and orange suit. And there's more emphasis on the clown makeup than Heath Ledger's Joker. And it, he looks more like a clown than his altered skin does in other interpretations. So th I really like that. And then there's the mental illness aspect of this sort of Joker. And then... The fact that he has a lack of confidence. So, 
in Jack, Jack Nicholson's Joker from Tim Burton's Batman, Jack Napier, Jack was a criminal mastermind before he became the Joker. And for Heath Ledger's Joker, Christopher Nolan's uh, Dark Knight, we don't know much about him, but we know that he's intelligent, competent, intimidating, and he's basically the embodiment of ordered chaos. While Arthur, he's insecure, he's unsure of where his life is going. He questions his own existence. So he's dealing with the most basic fundamentals of existentialism and meaning. He's mentally ill, he's clumsy. And the only time the Joker is really clumsy is when he's going up against a competent person like Batman. Which is why in the Dark Knight trilogy, when the Joker is you know, hanging upside down, he's like, did you really think I would risk this all in a fist fight with you? Because he's a mastermind. But in this, he, the Joker doesn't plan chaos. He inadvertently creates it, and then he embraces it. And he's like, oh, you know, look at what I just did. People are noticing me. All right, this is awesome. I'm going to... They allude to the fact that he's going to keep doing it. Which is what makes this Joker so unique. Now, let's get to the question that everybody is knowing, I th or wondering. I think most people, up until this movie, knew for sure that Heath Ledger's Joker was the best live-action interpretation of Joker. And then, when uh, stills came out for this movie, people were like, wow, maybe this is going to take the cake. And... What do I think? Do I think this is? Do I think Joaquin Phoenix's interpretation of the Joker is superior to Heath Ledger's interpretation of the Joker? The thing is, is in my opinion, you cannot compare the two. It's not possible. It's like trying to compare. It's really apples to oranges. They're both fruit, but one citrus and one starchy. So comparing Heath Ledger's Joker to Arthur's Joker, or uh, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, is impossible. Because Heath Ledger's Joker is a play on the stereotypical Joker. He had all the characteristics. He was confident. He was scheming. He had a dark sense of humor. And he wore the, he wore the purple suit. He had the green hair. He had... The exact colors, color scheme that the Joker had. It was just the realistic version of the Joker. But this Joker, it's not the criminal mastermind that we're used to. And <clears throat> that's not to say that this Joker won't become a criminal mastermind, but this Joker isn't there yet. He's not this underground, organizing, scheming Joker. And so if we're talking about capturing. What we expect from Joker, Heath Ledger's Joker is superior in that that regard because Heath Ledger did the voice. You know, he kind of had this voice, which is what we've come to expect from the Joker. I mean, Jack Napier didn't, you know, uh, Jack Nicholson didn't have that type of voice, but he had the laugh. But this is why Heath Ledger's Joker was superior to Jack Nicholson's Joker. And Jack Nich Nicholson's Joker at one time was considered the best. But we got Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger captured the essence of the Joker. Like, you don't... When you watch The Dark Knight, you don't have any problems with saying, Yeah, that's the Joker. That's definitely the Joker. Has the laugh and then the voice. He's like, I'm not crazy. Or, I feel that what doesn't kill you only makes you stranger. You know, stuff like that. This isn't that Joker, not yet. You can believe that this is the Joker, but this is so, so many miles apart from each other that you can't even compare them. Now, if I'm speaking from my personal preference, I'm going to go backwards. I'm only considering the live action interpretations of the Joker from non pornographic parodies as well. Um, so there's five live action interpretations that we have. Which is Heath Ledger, uh, Cesar Romero, Joaquin Phoenix, Jack Nicholson, and Jared Leto. So going backwards, so number one is the best, number five is the worst in my opinion. So going backwards at number five is Jared Leto, 
Number four is Cesar Romero. Number three, Jack Nicholson. Number two, Joaquin Phoenix. And then number one, Heath Ledger. And this is why. Because, I'm going to state it. Heath Ledger captured what the Joker is. He is the Joker. Joaquin Phoenix isn't the Joker that we expect. You might have a problem with saying that's the Joker. Not saying that this isn't a good Joker, but it's not the interpretation of the Joker that works like... You can see Heath Ledger's Joker being the original comic book Joker. Because it works. Because it is the Joker. This version of the Joker is miles apart from being what we expect from like Heath Ledger, Cesar Romero, uh, Mark Hamill. You know, th these Jokers are iconic for being faithful to Joker. Joaquin Phoenix's isn't. But Joaquin Phoenix is added number two because this is such an interesting interpretation of the Joker. I want to see more. I would love to see this Joker on t Like, I would love to see more Heath Ledger Joker, but that's not going to happen. Unfortunately, Heath Ledger passed away. He's dead. Joaquin Phoenix exists. And I like this Joker <clears throat> for different reasons that I stated. So, let's talk about this movie. So, I could give this movie a rating, right? I could say, you know, uh, 4 out of 5. I could say 9 out of 10. I could say a 15 out of 20. I could say I give it an 85 out of 100. There's, you know, I could say I give it an A, I give it a B, I give it a B plus, a B minus, an A minus, whatever. I personally, I, I kind of refuse to rate movies. And I, I, I do concede... That there are objective standards to judge a movie with. However, I I find it difficult to put an arbitrary number, letter, or rating on something that is... I mean, in reality, based on my own subjective interpretations of the application and execution of these standards that constitute a good movie. Um, there's too many facets to plug in and consider to calculate a score. Because every movie has its flaws. But one of the questions is, is does the quality of the movie and the good stuff of the movie outshine the flaws? So I'm going to keep it simple. Um, I'm going to keep it, keep it really simple. There's five aspects that I'm looking for in a movie. Okay. Did I personally enjoy the movie? Do I recommend the movie? Would I want to rewatch the movie? Were the flaws distracting? And would I add this movie to my collection? So another way to phrase it is, did I have fun during the movie? Would I tell, do I think other people need to see a movie? Do I want other people to see this movie? Would I say tell my best friend? My dad, my brother, or my mom to go see this movie, or my cousin or something, or my coworker would I say, dude, you gotta see this movie? If the movie was on TV, would I watch it again? Or if my friend was like, hey, do you want to go see the movie for a second time? I'll pay for you. Or if my friend's like, yeah, hey, let's have a movie night. Do you want to see it? Or if I had, you know, if I was having a movie night with, like, my girlfriend or something, would I want to rewatch it with her? Or with somebody who hasn't seen it, would I want to rewatch it in that case? Were the, f were the flaws distracting? Meaning, you know, did the good stuff outshine the bad stuff? Was there a mistake that caught my attention that I couldn't stop thinking of? Was there a decision that was bad which distracted me and kept me from being immersed in the story? That could be anything like a, an inconsistency in continuity. Continuity error could be a plot hole. It could be a really weird decision in the story or the plot or the camera angle that takes me out, which would be considered a flaw. And then the last one is, you know, if would I want to physically own this movie or would I want the digital copy of it or would I want, it, would I want to own this movie in general? So those are the basic five questions. So did I personally enjoy the movie? Yes. 
I did enjoy this movie. Again, I thought it was fun. I thought this was a profound movie that wasn't overtly complex. It wasn't ostentatious. It wasn't pretentious. And it was colloquial. People could understand it, which is what I liked about it. Um, do I recommend the movie? Uh, 100%. I think people should watch it. I want people to see this movie. I want people to talk about this Joker. I want people to enjoy this Joker. I want people to imagine what it would be like if this Joker was in the DCEU. Or, what if this Joker was in the Dark Knight instead of Heath Ledger? Or, how, how does this iconic Joker become... Or, how does it stack up with Heath Ledger's iconic Joker? I want people to watch this movie because I think they're missing out if they don't whether or not they're comic book aficionados or connoisseurs would I want to rewatch the movie if one of my friends was like hey you want to go watch the movie again I'll pay for you I'd be like yeah dude why not or if it's on TV later on I'll say hell yeah I'll sit back relax and just watch it especially on a day off were the flaws distracting honestly I didn't see any flaws I'm sure there are flaws. I'm sure if I rewatch the movie over and over again, I'm sure in some comment section somewhere somebody's pointing out a plot inconsistency, a continuity issue, or something distracting. But I was so immersed in the film that I didn't notice flaws. And to me, that's the mark of a good film. Would I add this movie to my collection? Yes, I want to own this movie. I want the digital and physical copy of this movie. The only... Like, I have physical copies of superhero movies, but typically when I buy a movie or get a physical copy of a movie, I have it in, like, one of those book sleeves. But there's three movies. There's superhero movies that I have the case to, as well as the physical copy, and that's Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Trilogy. And when this comes out on Blu-ray, I am buying this. Well, I'm buying the... I, I like buying the Blu-ray plus disc plus digital. Or a plus DVD, plus digital copy. Now I'm going to put the DVD in the sleeve. And then I'm keeping the Blu-ray in the Blu-ray case. And I'm adding it to my Dark Knight Trilogy collection. Because it's one of those movies I want to own. So this movie touches all five of what I want from a movie. So in that case, if I did give it a rating, it would be a 5 out of 5 from my personal scale. If that makes sense. Go watch Joker. It's a fantastic movie. I hope you all have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed this video. There is more to come. There is going to be a movie review every single Monday, or at least a topic about a movie, every single Monday. And then if I go to the movies to watch another movie that is not, you know, on a Monday, then a video will be uploaded, uh, you know, not on Monday. Always, a video is always going to be uploaded on Mondays, but there might be extras depending on if I go and see a movie. Have a good day. I hope you enjoyed Movie Libertas.